All right, well, we are going to get going. In case you didn't know, this is take two. We're trying to uh, bring David in remotely for this week's happy hour. Hope everybody's had a good week. Uh, let's see here. We got to add him. Add. All right, let's see if we can get him up. Let's see. Hey, no. There he is. There's the man of the hour. All right, are we live? We are live. How you doing, Neil Ainsworth? Good to see you. David, what's happening? Why are you not in the uh, happy hour studio today? Man, I am uh, out of town. I'm heading to uh, a men's retreat this weekend. So um, uh, I'm going to have no phone for three days. So literally Man. about an hour after we hang up here, I'm gone. Not going to have any contact with the world. I mean, it's going to be the first time Man. in years. It'll be the last happy hour for the weekend, I, I presume, right? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's going to be it's going to be a good day. Get away from the world a little bit and uh, get into uh, spending some time with with some other guys and 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 the Holy Spirit and uh, learning some stuff and just kind of unplugging for a little bit. That's good. That's good stuff, man. Hey, Nick Barnes, how you hey, doing? Hey, Kathy Mangle. Man, this is good stuff. Well. You got any uh, big spring break plans coming up? Man, I don't. I don't. Uh, now, I know next year will be uh, – Next year you do. Next year we'll be cruising the seas on the new ship, but uh, uh, not this year. Probably probably have to just do some work, work some overtime. Yeah, I'll, I'll think about you as I'm uh, drinking uh, – well, th not this kind of tea maybe, but, uh, but uh, we're headed down to – on the celebrity equinox down to the Western Caribbean. So uh, that'll be nice. should be fun. That'll be nice. Yeah. Well, uh, well, let's get going. I mean, you know, hey, that's why we're here, right? Talk a little real estate. Uh, yeah. What we got to talk see? about Talking about the market stats. I mean, I tell you, we got a pretty uh, tight inventory, don't we? Yes. Yeah, we do. And uh, I think I think it's all over the place. You've got a lot of people that are uh, making offers and uh, it's a competitive, very competitive situation. So that's driving up prices. Rates are moving up as well. So I'm sure that there are a lot of frustrated buyers out there. I'm sure you see it all the time. Yeah, I mean, actually, you know, we got 12, we're down 12 percent in inventory. I mean, the biggest issue we're facing right now is inventory. Inventory is down 12% from January of a year ago. And, you know, we're down to 4,900 houses. You know, to put that in perspective, we were at nine, in, in 2011, we were at 9,000 houses on average. So nearly 50% uh, decrease in the number of houses that are available. Wow. And you said, what, what, what are the numbers now? Well, right now we got about 4,943 mm. houses at the end of January, the last time. It was tabulated compared to, you know, just let's talk about uh, 2011, uh, 9,269 and about 500 from last year. So it's, uh, man, it's tough because the demand has not shrunk on these houses or for the buyers. That should be right. And, and the demand is probably going to only increase going into the spring season. This is usually when, when people decide to do something, uh, you know, they've been thinking about it for a couple of months, especially if it's, uh, uh, you, you know, the, the weather has been a little bit colder than normal. So I think people are thinking about this a lot more. And uh, um, it's going to be a little bit more demand coming up in the next few months. Well, well, you know, what's interesting, though, is that, you know, here in Birmingham, we've got two big counties. We've got Jefferson County, Shelby County. And really, Shelby County stayed pretty flat in terms of uh, the amount of inventory on the market. I mean, so what we've seen is Jefferson County has been the one kind of lagging behind. And, uh, you know, one of the good things is average sales price, ironically, has gone up. Hey, C-Corp, how are you? Yeah, that's a good that's a good number. That's a good number. I mean, now, I know you've got some I mean, stats across the, uh, across the board here for different areas. And, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm surprised on, on some of the – the decrease in the foreclosure sales. They're way down from, from the highs we've seen in years past. Amazing, isn't it? I mean, it's, it, what's amazing is, is where we were when you and I started, right? Mid-2000s, I mean, we were, golly. I mean, it was 40% of the market in some places, right? Yeah. 
you know, and I, I mean, I think, you know, one of the big things everybody asks is what about the average sales price, you know, and it, it increased this January to about 229,000. That's up 3%. But if you go back and you look at the foreclosures, the foreclosures are only averaging, you know, roughly around 104,000. So in other words, it was the lower end stuff that was getting foreclosed on, right? Right. Yeah. And that's, and, and that's significant. Uh, so obviously those foreclosure sales are going to bring the averages way down. And that, you know, one thing that begs the question, is there anything that folks need to do to know about buying a foreclosure uh, that's different, say, from buying a uh, just your typical resale? Yeah, the biggest thing we run into on a foreclosure is going to be the condition of the property and sometimes working with the seller because obviously the seller is going to be a bank and things like that. So uh, many times they are not going to be as flexible on, on making repairs or giving concessions uh, to buyers, uh, but certainly the condition because there's very few, let's say, bank-owned properties where they're going to go in and put money in, fixing them up and doing things like that. Well, that's, that's good stuff. And, you know, the, the one of the great things, everybody wants to know, hey, where should I be buying, right? Where Where's my investment the safest? And, hey, stats aren't lying. That southern region, what we call the southern region, which is really south side. Hey, Courtney. Uh, uh, <laughs> she makes me laugh. Uh, it's south side south towards Calera, towards Chelsea. So you go through the over the mountain cities. Those are the strongest. In fact, I mean, I think that the average sales price there, what uh, of a non foreclosure was three hundred nine thousand. Which our friends around the country are probably laughing at us when we say that is huge. But yeah, that's a good for number. Us it is. That's a good number. And, you know, where have we seen the biggest decrease is in the northern region, that Gardendale, Kimberly, Hayden, Warrior, those areas. I mean, get this, though, David, a 40% decline year over year in the January of 17 to January of 18 in terms of the numbers from those two months. That's big. Yeah. I, yeah, that's a big you know. drop. And you think that's uh, that's because there's less houses on the market or – yeah, I, I, well, I think I think folks don't know what to do. They feel stuck. They they they're stuck where they are, and they don't they they want to have assurances that they're going to be able to get out, you know, and, and get to where they're going. I mean, you know, just yesterday I, we were at a house that and we were writing an offer on the back of my car, and literally, it, by the way, it goes on the market at eleven a.m. Eleven a.m. is when they hit the little switch, whatever that magic button is. At 4 o'clock, we're writing the offer on the back of the thing. Here comes the agent, the listing agent, whipping around in his truck and putting an under contract sign. Just like that, huh? And Yeah, I, it's a sign of what we're dealing with, isn't it? It is. It is. It's, it's a very competitive market. Uh, sellers uh, have to love it in, in certain price ranges because they're obviously going to have more buyers uh, than there are houses right now in, in a lot of areas. Right. And so uh, what about one of the biggest concerns I have is when they need to jump on it, what's the importance of and how hard is it to get a pre-approval letter or some proof so they can submit in these quick turnarounds? Well, I mean, it's, it's as soon as you get serious about wanting to buy a house, you need to talk to a lender and get those things knocked out so we can uh, so we can pull credit and take a look at things and, and go ahead and have that letter together. I would say, especially with as competitive as it is right now, you probably need to have the letter before you walk in the house. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it helps because y'all can change them too. I mean, that's a good thing. Once you have it done, I'm sure it's easy on y'all's end. Oh, absolutely. That, it takes 10, 15 seconds to, to change the information and send you a new one. All right. Well, I know you want to talk to us a little bit about escrows. Well, I just wanted to uh, to bring bring you some information today. It's a uh, kind of a small part of the the mortgage process, and uh, but it's sometimes confused by people. Uh, but basically, the escrow portion of your monthly payment is going to be the taxes, the real estate taxes, and the homeowners insurance. Um, those the those estimates are going to be rolled into your mortgage payment, and your lender is going to keep an escrow account. So basically they are, uh, they are ensuring that the real estate taxes and the homeowner's insurance is paid on time. Cause obviously that threatens their mortgage. So 
Uh, so they're going to set that up. The mortgage insurance could possibly be in there as well. Uh, it's collected at closing, and basically we collect the entire first year homeowner's insurance and then a couple of months of cushion uh, at closing. So that – Who determines that, David? Who determines that? How much is collected? Well, uh, it's a calculation the attorney does, but basically there's uh, there's tables where they can uh, estimate – the money taken into the escrow account and make sure that there's never less than two months of that amount um, available. Um, so we're, we're collecting those taxes uh, prorated from October 1st to the, to the previous year. Um, Why is it October 1st again? Now our, our tax year is October 1st in Alabama. So that's when they, they assess properties and the taxes on October 1st. Uh, and then the taxes are due, I think banks usually pay them in December, but they're due October 1. Uh, but that's so also, they collect interest for three months. Yeah, and that's right. also a big date because that's when you have to have your homestead filed. Um, and your homestead exemption, you can file on a primary residence, and usually that cuts the taxes in half. And if you have a non-homestead property, and the reason I brought this topic up today is because I've got this situation on, on a property closing uh, early next week, um, the borrower actually decided to waive escrows, which means they are going to pay the taxes and insurance on their own when they come due. Uh, banks won't let you do this unless you put at least 20% down. Um, and they Why are, would I want to do it, David? Uh, you would want to do it just so you hold on to that money instead of the bank holding on to it. Uh, let's just say, for example, the, the total of your taxes and insurance are you know, four or $5,000. Well, you control that money instead of paying it to the bank and letting them hold on to it every month. So there's, in other words, my payment, I'm still paying it. So in some ways, I, maybe I, for ease, most people would, I would think, right, choose to escrow it anyway. Yeah, most people escrow it anyway. Most people have to escrow because they don't put enough down to have the option. Uh, but it's really, it's really easy. Most people don't want to think about it. They don't want to, you know, write the check when the insurance comes due. They don't want to have to worry about uh, write the check when the taxes come due. So most people, yeah, they'll, they'll typically escrow it anyway. Um, let's see here. Now, when, when we're talking about this homestead situation, let's say you were to purchase a property now, but you still own a, a home. Um, you would probably, you, you, you won't want to switch that homestead until you have to, which would be uh, to lock it in on the new property. So that October 1st date is going to determine when you want to do that. So if you're already past October 1st and you're going to sell the houses in a, in a couple of months, then go ahead and leave the, the homestead on the current home you have. Wait till you the, sell that one and then transfer the well, homestead. I mean, it's about 50% off. When it's about 50% off. And if you do it the right way, then the buyer on your current home won't have a problem with the non-homestead taxes coming in. Because uh, sometimes that could cause a problem. When we set up our escrow accounts for the new mortgage, we have to collect right. escrows for that higher amount. So um, definitely could be some questions out there on that. So so feel free to to reach out to us if you if you have any questions on that. I'm going to ask you a quick question on that. Yeah. So we get asked a lot. Hey, I bought a non homesteaded property, and obviously I'm escrowing now when I purchased it at the non-homestead rate, what do I need to do about getting them changed? Okay, so that's a, that's a great question. Now, typically, mortgage lenders are going to analyze those escrow accounts every January, okay? Um, and, there's, and they're, quote, unquote, let's see, regulated by yeah, the government. You, you got it. Yeah. You got it. Quote, unquote, regulated by the government. So um, they've got to, they, they can't keep too much money in there. Uh, so let's say you close on, on a house in February, right now, it's non-homesteaded. You file your homestead. So October 1st, you're going to pay the non-homesteaded amount, right? And then you okay. contact the county and get an estimate on the homestead rate because they're going to go down. They go ahead and send that to your mortgage lender right. and have them review that and change them the following January. Now, sometimes I know a lot of y'all, Tisa, what's happening? Hey, the pride of Auburn basketball back in the day. <laughs> you, hey, David, that girl could push you around. She, hey, she can dunk, I think. But anyway, <laughs> uh, hey, Tisa, what's up? How about 
pounding that like button, Tisa, so I know you're there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so when we talk about that, now, does the, do I call you or do I call, because oftentimes y'all are selling the loans to say BB&T, one of the big 10 banks, Yeah. right? You sell the loan. Who do I call? Do I call you? Or do I call Bank of America? You're going to want to call your, your servicer. But if you have any problems or have any questions, you can always call me, of course. But, yeah, you're going to need to call who's servicing the loan, who you're actually sending those payments to. And you don't want to send your payments to me because they will come take your house. <laughs> take your house? Man, this is rough. <laughs> well, hey, I, I, hey who, whoever's house you're at now, I take their house. I love their <laughs> Man. Somebody's got style, don't they? Nice, nice. So what do we got next? Uh, well, we're going to talk about, you know, there's a big raging debate out there right now between about Airbnb. Are you familiar with Airbnb? Yes, yes. Like VRBO, uh, these temporary short-term rentals. We're starting to see it trickle into Birmingham. Had it happen, we manage a condo development here. The homeowners didn't like it because somebody bought a unit with the intention of doing Airbnb. And I'm telling you, you would not believe the rates they got. I mean, it, it's amazing. And if anybody doesn't know what Airbnb does, it's very temporary. It's one night housing. It's basically, you're creating a hotel out of a rental home, essentially. And so what a lot of HOAs and cities are having trouble with is they want to regulate it for two reasons. One is they're not making any money on the taxes, right? And the uh, HOAs are worried about safety, which I don't understand because that's making a presumption that all homeowners are cool people. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, and anybody that visits an Airbnb obviously is not, um, you know, and so big thing passing right now. I mean, Nashville, big test case right now up in Nashville because they're worried about it. Not only hurting, diminishing, you know, you have a nice home. You spent 300,000 on and guess what? Here comes a temporary uh, rental, and there the people move, and they just are Airbnb in it, and they have a different person in the house every night, every week, yeah. whatever it may be. And, you know, so folks are not feeling comfortable with that, but it's something that we're going to – it's a uh, it's kind of like Uber, I, I would presume, wouldn't you? Yeah. Like the problem? So they're definitely worried about the uh, property values around there, uh, and I guess, you know, maybe let's say – It'd be kind of, kind of like having a family right next to a hotel, right? Yeah. Well, exactly, exactly. You know, I, I think, though, I have a hard time, though, when the market got tough. You know, homeowners need a place to go with their house. I mean, if this can generate income to keep them from getting foreclosed on, I think we can't re forget 2008 uh, as these folks are trying or our legislators, et cetera, are coming up with ideas on this. Yes, yeah, I mean, I, there's definitely situations, and I, I think they're both both sides of this argument uh, could could be could be heard. And I'm sure there's plenty of people that would not want uh, that kind of of traffic in the neighborhood all the time, turning over and, and things like that. And I know there's there's obviously some events that happen um, that where the demand for housing in certain areas um, goes up. I'm not sure that happens as much in, in Birmingham, but I know there's, you know, certain events that, uh, that do, that, that, that does increase uh, the demand for housing and opens up. Well, I mean, the other thing too, is it hurts rental prices. Rental prices go, Phew, it's good for our investor owners. Right. But uh, because let more demand, because less, some of these houses are taken off the traditional rental market and are put into Airbnb yeah. and VRBO. I mean, uh, yes, it's tough. Um, and, you know, one, one of the last things I'll say on this, in case anybody's really interested, is you'll be shocked at who the special interest groups are that are – they're they're rallying like, uh, I don't know, uh, like it's a campaign. Is the special interest groups tied to hotels and the lodging industry? Of course they don't want it any more than the taxis want it Uber. Yes. But at the end of the day, the consumer will win out, don't you think? Yeah, if it threatens their business model, then they're not going to want it. Um, but if it is better for the consumer, uh, obviously that they're going to have to be able to save some money and and compete with those other big businesses that are offering the same thing. Well, I I know that you got to get back on the road, and uh, uh, but didn't want to leave without you talking about the chili cook. -off. Yeah, yeah, we are going to have uh, 
It's we're the title sponsor, and it's uh, next Saturday, uh, March the third. Um, it's our chili cookoff, benefiting the exceptional foundation, um, which serves mentally and physically challenged folks in the Birmingham area. They have a a twelve thousand, I think, square foot recreation center over by Homewood Park. Um, over by Nate Beals, I believe. Yeah, and this is their largest fundraiser. Um, they came into the office and and talked to us, and uh, it was just a very uh, uplifting story about the the kids that are there. I think most of the kids are over twenty one. Um, they do have school aged children, but it's uh, it's th- those are mainly after school programs. But, you know, Trisha Kirk is the, the CEO of the Exceptional Foundation. She was really funny, really nice lady. Um, yeah, tough job, too. Yeah, yeah. And, and she just said that the biggest thing that stood out to me was she said that I can't, I can't tell anybody we don't have room for their baby, you know, um, you know for their wow. child. And, wow. and they want to, uh, you know, she, they do a lot for for those guys, and and this is their biggest fundraiser. So um, we're going to be there. We're going to have a booth set up. Uh, we we haven't done this before, so it'll be our first time. We're excited, and then um, I would go to exceptionalfoundation.org for information on tickets. But it's going to be next Saturday, uh, at Brookwood Village, from ten thirty to three p.m. So you guys come out. Now, are you here. cooking? I'm, I know you, we will have a booth with chili, and I will probably have to cook, but it is not my recipe. <laughs> well, you, hey, I will give you a piece of trivia that I learned from old Ken Williams, who's now a chef here in Birmingham. Real chili does not have beans. I mean, who knew? No beans. I think I've no had beans. beans. He thinks that you should be, because he goes every year to this cook-off. It's a huge deal here in Birmingham. Uh, he firmly believes that you should be disqualified from if you have beans in the chili. Well, I hope he's not judging next week. Because there will be a lot of beans. Yeah, he'll be kicking a lot out. Well, anyway, I know that this went by pretty quick. We want to get you back on the road, but, man, safe travels. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we will tune it back in next week. Same time, 4 o'clock next week. Uh, there's Mark. Hey, Mark, you finally made it. Thank you, you Mark. A little bit late, but we like it, buddy. That's funny. All right. Mahalo. See you. See you, man.